Yes. We don't see the presentation. You don't see the presentation? Where are no. we? It's, I think it's just wait one minute. <laughs> it, it will come out. Okay, it's okay. coming up. Okay, it's coming? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please tell us when is everything okay. So maybe we can start now, do we? Yeah, yeah, I think. Is everything okay? Everybody can see the PDF? Okay, yeah. Good for me. All right. Uh, so, uh, maybe we start now. Yes. Okay. Please. Okay. Bon, uh, bon dia, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to to hear uh, this talk by Stefanella. Uh, sorry for the delay due to the network. And uh, <laughs> we talk about vortex and gravitational model. And uh, I would like to ask. Everyone to turn off the microphone and the camera so that the presentation is going to, going to be smoother. So now the time is yours, Stefanella. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for organizing this uh, worldwide meeting. That this is at least one of the advantages of the pandemic to bring people together, doesn't matter where they are geographically located. So today I hope is just uh, a conversation with you and um, is a conversation that to me took uh, some years and actually it started with this guy here that is celebrated his Deberto. so I, 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 I'm sorry I didn't write in Chinese because I didn't know how to write Chinese in left hand okay so I, it's missing Chinese so uh, it's exactly 20 years ago that uh, Ildeberto was visiting uh, the Bureau de Longitude in Paris and I was asked to give like uh, a, an informal talk for some youth uh, researcher days and I thought no one would care about vortices in, uh, in the observatory and, and my French was terrible at the time so I, I gave my talk without too much hope and then Ildeberto, at the end of 15 minutes, raised his hand and he asked me, would you like to come to Brazil? So it was a, <laughs> was a totally unexpected outcome. But so that started my journey to Brazil. So happy birthday, Ildeberto. So and that started the journey also with this uh, this uh, combination of gravity and vortices and uh, this combination of, of traditional tools of uh, traditional tools of uh, celestial mechanics in the vortex uh, world. So in the meantime, they were also asked to be appointed three very courageous uh, uh, master students, Rodrigo, Renata, and Glaston, that embrace, embrace these kind of challenges to have to pull up different strings from different kind of a math tool and Glaston even numerics tool. And so they did, uh, we learn a lot together. And, uh, and of course, I had different kind of help also in thinking about all these things and important contribution, you know, each of, I couldn't make it uh, without all these people, you know, David, Jair, Carlos, Teresa, and of course, the Berta. But then what I'm presenting today uh, is just about the modeling, mostly, and at the end, some result of Glaston. I'm not talking also about uh, some of the work that I did also actually most Jamie, uh, Jamie did and Claudio Vidal did uh, about some other uh, analyzing the dynamics. Okay, so this is about, just about the formulation, how to formulate uh, this kind of vortex and mass dynamics on a general manifold. And today we'll be concentrating on surfaces. So first of all, uh, we we have to take a ride on the the modeling part and how this has two kinds of general uh, 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 
modeling, there is the theoretical modeling, and there is the empirical modeling that is more data fitting. And then eventually each of them on their own can put together some mathematical models. And uh, eventually this is of interest of uh, a large uh, community of researcher because a mathematical model might need to have new kind of maths to be studied. And on the other hand, they can make prediction that eventually can be uh, tested with observation, okay? So today I'm just talking about this left-hand side, about how, about the theoretical modeling part. So, and since we are in Brazil, we, uh, we have to uh, mention that uh, Brazil has this contribution in, in general relativity in 1919. And it was in Brazil that was tested uh, the Einstein theory. Uh, and in fact, here is, is the newspaper of the period where uh, they were measuring the deflection of life. I tried to, I hope I can make it bigger. The deflection of light of a star here on the left hand side, the, the light rays were deflected. And the apparent position in the sky would be this on the right hand side. So this was the, uh, this was a, uh, um, this was something that was uh, the Einstein theory was on 1911 and this was 1919. So it was, uh, it was a big, uh, was a big confirmation. And uh, uh, a, a New York Times of the 10th of November also related to the fact that uh, start not where they seem or were calculated to be, but nobody needs to worry. Okay, so I thought that this was a, was a, the first uh, glimpse of GR was already maybe, you know, no star is falling on your head, but okay. So, and uh, nowadays we, we can test GR uh, with, uh, with more sophisticated tool because now we can even uh, uh, deflect, we can even measure the deflection, the deflection of light of a distant galaxy. And, and now uh, the deflection is caused by a quasar or black hole uh, or quasar. And uh, the, the formulation, the mathematical formulation that interests mathematician is the equivalence principle, mm -hmm. where either you have uh, your quasar or your, si or your sun deflecting the light, your source of the gravitational field present there in your formulation, or other you incorporate this into the geometry of the space time. And now you're looking at a geodesic motion in a new kind of manifold, space time manifold. Okay? And then, of course, we have to thank Herman Nikoski for you know, starting this, uh, this formulation of the space time. And then, of course, uh, physics cannot uh, uh, forget David Hilbert with variation formulation on the Heisen, uh, with the Heisen Hilbert action. So, this again is, is, a, is a, an ensemble of researchers with different kinds of speciality that join together, and, uh, and, and what we call general relativity. We have to remember it's not just one person but it's, it's, it's an evolution of the subject and many contribution. Okay, so going back to our theoretical modeling, okay? So what is theoretical modeling? So all theoretical formulation are based on axiom. So the mathematician call, it, call them axiom or postulate, sometimes physicists might calling them working hypothesis. Uh, and then so you can, these are the, the fundament, the, the building blocks of your new house, your new theory. Uh, and this is what you're going to base on the construction, okay? And then if the construction is good or not, with respect what you aim to uh, model, this has to be then tested by observation an experiment and eventually you want you might want to change some of the axiom and construct the new house. 
so as an example, we are all familiar with the Euclidean versus non Euclidean geometry, and we're all familiar with the fifth postulate. Two parallel line, straight lines never intersect. But of course, this, uh, this postulate is valid in the usual, what's called uh, Euclidean geometry. So, for example, the planar geometry. But then on the sphere, the sphere that is the geometry uh, very close to our planet, we know that now straight line are replaced by the circle. And these they do intersect. So we have to remove that fifth postulate when we change the geometry of our space. Now, for Newtonian mechanics, uh, we also have axiom of Newtonian mechanics. Uh, maybe when uh, at first, at least, I studied uh, my first year uh, physics, uh, I didn't realize they were exactly axiom, but they are axioms. So we have the law of inertia, we have F equal MA, and we have the, the third law that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. But we are so familiar with this because it's in our uh, 3D world that uh, that we never thought about maybe if these are un uh, universal axioms. Are they still valid in all the geometries? Yes or no? And uh, so the same thing about gravity now. How do we do define gravity? Once more, we are very familiar with all gravity brings in our tree. So in our tree, we have the force that is uh, uh, proportional to the mass, but is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the mass. Then we are familiar with the fact that it's an attractive central force. And then we are familiar with the fact that uh, Kepler's law are valid you know, when considering two uh, planets. But are these, so are these the axiom of gravity, all of three, one of them, and uh, are these three facts that we observe in, uh, in our Euclidean tree world, uh, are these universal for other kinds of geometry? And we, we really know that, uh, for example, when we, uh, when we talk about gravity uh, of galaxy dynamics, already the kind of potential is, lo is a logarithm that one use is not uh, one over our square. So we already know that in some setting, this one over our square, it, it doesn't apply as a good model, okay? So, and now is also another point of view. When we want to extend our, uh, our gravity to other kind of geometry, for example, surfaces, what kind of point of view are we taking? Because we can take an extrinsic point of view, like our, uh, our surface, for example, like our Earth is, uh, is part of a bigger universe. Uh, so is embedded in a higher dimensional manifold, like for example, our tree. Or we can take an intrinsic point of view where we just consider like flat landers. And I strongly encourage uh, this uh, to read this book, The Shape of the Space by Jeffrey Weeks, that it, uh, it strongly uh, uh, make people think about this other intrinsic point of view. And he, he it's, a, it's a rewrite of the famous Flatland book of the beginning of the 20th century. And actually, the Shape of the Space, I read both. The Shape of the Space is much more, uh, well, it's easy to read, but uh, doesn't, uh, it's easy to read and it's complete with the more formal theory. But anyway, what will be, for example, uh, if we have, if we don't have the option of space uh, notion, if, uh, if we cannot go out in the space, how, how uh, someone living on the earth, now thought as a two-dimensional manifold, can actually discover the topology of the uh, and geometry of uh, his or her planet. Okay, so the book is suggesting some topological measure <laughs> uh, with the uh, loops theory 
uh, different kind of loops to kind of see uh, with uh, with different kind of two different kind of travelers to kind of discover this shape. Okay, so we ha we have to be clear we kind of want to be with taking. Okay, so each point of view is valid. I want to stress, but and of course, uh, experiment will make the difference. But we have to be clear about that. So, for example, in an extrinsic geometry, uh, you will have you will have the the potential of our tree, and you just force it to be on the plane. In an intrinsic one, instead, you as we will see, we will have a different potential. We will have a log potential, and this potential, for example, doesn't emit capital law. We lose capital law. And this is already discussed some way as everything. There is a lot of things in other book of classical mechanics. And uh, Rodrigo Schaeffer uh, dis uh, discussed more at length, uh, showing some result in his master thesis. Uh, then there is another point. This might be connected also in some more recent results on what is the shape of our universe. Uh, this was very intriguing article that, uh, uh, commenting this on Quantum Magazine of November 2019. Uh, what is the shape of the universe? And your study suggests we have got it all wrong. Of course, you know, try to make the list be splashy. But this is related to a serious uh, article about uh, observational um, uh, measures, cosmological measures of the same year, November, 4th of November, 2019. And so the suggestion of this, uh, this new measure is that uh, maybe our universe is close. And mathematically, uh, this brings stronger uh, constraints when we solve some fundamental equation of our model. Then also, uh, we have uh, some related problem about, uh, as I hope I will convince you, that the gravitational problem is somehow related also to vortex, the vortex problem. So for example, these are, this is, uh, 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 I'm sorry, this is Jupiter. And this is the famous uh, red spot in Jupiter on the right hand side. And we see all these vortices, they are like cyclone and anti cyclone. And we see that sometimes they stay at some latitude. Okay. This, for example, there was uh, already a, an article about Tobani in 96 and Cho, uh, modeling this kind of uh, this planet and this vortex structure. But then more recently, we have these beautiful uh, uh, images of the polar cap of Jupiter and Saturn. They again show rings. Yeah, okay, I hope that I can convince you. They have actually on the two poles. They have actually on the two poles. So, and actually this is hard to know that uh, it's, uh, an octagon, but sometimes they say there could be two uh, squares joined together. So I mean, it's hard to know. But there is a central, there is a central vortex stabilizing, apparently stabilizing the structure. And this is Saturn on the right that has also uh, as this hexagonal um, screen, vortex screen. So this kind of um, structure also. Uh, they're very interesting to study. So stability of these polygonal rings uh, and why they do occur at some latitude or, or, or not. And um, so for this, I will start with this talking about vorticity problem and then we'll go to gravitational problem. Uh, so it's okay so far. I cannot give a, a, a talk or a lecture without hearing anyone. <laughs> So, if someone say yes or no, no, words. Yes, yes, great. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, no. so okay, so let's talk about incompressible fluids. So again, what is the vortex? Sure, they make people moving in circular motion. This we saw the. The, uh, the Jupiter red spot here to the right. Uh, mathematically, uh, 
uh, if we uh, u, u is the velocity verti uh, uh, the velocity field of a particle that uh, physically one say is advected by a vorticity field omega mathematically we have the the rotation of u is equal to omega then we say that this fluid is e. We lost your presentation. Hello? We lost your yeah. presentation. It's loading. Yeah, we okay. I see. Okay, so, uh, so we were saying that the test particle, it's, it's a particle that is just passively uh, transported by uh, the velocity field created by some entity like the vortex. And uh, this velocity field is called incompressible if the divergence of, of u is equal to zero. So roughly, mathematically speaking, is preserving areas or volume, it, depending on the, uh, the dimension. Uh, and in particular, uh, this right hand side, the omega, that is the engine, is the one uh, generating this vortex field. We say that it's it's a point vortex. Is if it's a singularity, it's all concentrated this motor in one point, and point that is steering up the closed uh, by fluid. Now, uh, incompressibility is strongly related to the Hamiltonian formalism, and this we do this to Kirchhoff already in the 19th century, uh, 1876 that you observe that whenever you have an incompressible fluid, for example, in R2 on the plane, we have the freedom to re-express the velocity components, uh, x dot and y dot, by means of an unknown function that we call it uh, in fluid, it's called the strong function. So we can rewrite uh, x dot, the derivative x, and the derivative y has an Hamiltonian system. Okay, and why is that? Because now when I replace it to my divergence, automatically this would guarantee that the divergence is zero. So of course, this uh, uh, suitable regular unknown function uh, it is not defined by this. It, it's just uh, uh, can be up to this level. It could be whatever sufficiently regular function. But so how to uh, to determine? So we need the second condition. We need the fact that we have that the curl of u is equal to omega, and the omega is an observable quantity. We measure the vorticity distribution in, in our, um, on our plane, in this case. And so omega is given. And now when I replace x dot and y dot uh, expressed by c into this second equation, so this, uh, uh, this curl of omega uh, of uh, u equal to omega. Now we obtain that the equation that C has to satisfy is the Poisson equation. Okay, so so we get to the equation that our string function has to verify given omega, given the vorticity distribution. Now, in I want just to start to stress that this coordinates for which we have this canonical Hamiltonian system are the area form, are the area form of the uh, uh, left, left the area form of the plane in, in the, its canonical form, dx uh, wedge dy, okay? So our good canonical variable. And in fact, in fact, uh, to do vortex dynamics theory in general on whatever Riemann surfaces, on one hand, we need a metric because we, we can show that the general equation to, uh, that we have to solve is again a Poisson equation, but now the delta de Laplacian now is the Laplace, the trime in Laplacian. Uh, so it's again the generalized, we can say Poisson equation, so in whatever uh, Riemannian uh, surfaces. And on the other hand, we also need a symplectic form because we have to deal with an Hamiltonian form, as, as we saw. And uh, so these two things have to go together and have to be compatible. 
And this, luckily for us, happened for all uh, Riemann uh, surfaces that are also have this dual nature of Taylor manifold. And, uh, and again, I can have something here. Okay. And again, so whenever we have a Riemannian manifold M with a metric G, we can associate the corresponding symplectic manifold where our uh, Hamiltonian flow is defined. And the uh, symplectic form is exactly the corresponding area form, omega. So in this sense, uh, when we consider, for example, an ellipsoid of revolution, and if we just to visualize better, we just use this uh, embedding in our tree, uh, we, we see that the corresponding area form is given by this expression, and so that uh, a possible pair of uh, conjugate variable is given by the, the longitude phi, but then the momentum is much more uh, complicated than, for example, the sphere, where on the sphere we will just have the uh, cosine variable. Here we have this, this integral expression. And in general, if we consider surface of revolution, like uh, we saw, I think last week, or oh, Tuesday, uh, I remember this from previous times. <laughs> uh, do we have that uh, the differential uh, form uh, uh, distances, uh, infinitesimal distance, it takes this expression and the corresponding area form uh, is, takes this expression. So again, we have a recipe now how to find all the good uh, canonical variable uh, in order to describe the motion on all surfaces of revolution. And this we comment this in an article with Carly Simo, but this actually we also previously done in an article with David Richel. And in fact, uh, in more we can study more general surface revolution like this one that is very interesting because this surface, for example, has both negative, positive, and zero curvature. So it's a, it's a surface with a variable curvature. And of course, we, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, interesting dynamics to be studying on it. Uh, but now, going back to how we vortex uh, gravity problem, what the compressible gravity have to do, have in common, and this is, is understood if we use the Helmholtz uh, Hodge theorem uh, for vector fields that is known to fluid dynamics in R3 and R2, that translates in the uh, in the Hodge decomposition theorem of P form uh, for general manifold, and um, so what is the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition that uh, students see in vector calculus? I hope they still see. So uh, whatever velocity field or uh, whatever vector field, so either velocity or in this case acceleration field, can be decomposed in three parts. Uh, uh, U one that is it's uh, uh, irrotational, but has the divergence uh, not zero. U2, that is divergence free, but it's not irrotational. And then U3, that is, um, uh, is both irrotational and it's uh, uh, divergence free. Okay. So the thing is that, and the same, we can do the same thing for the acceleration. So uh, the, uh, our, uh, Incompressible fluid belong to the second uh, part, the second category, and we show that our uh, generalization, or actually what we already uh, familiar with of central forces, uh, belong to the first class here on red. So they are uh, irrotational, but they are not divergence free. Okay, and the third component is the harmonic component. Uh, play a role of a little bit of uh, uh, bad kit because it makes this decomposition now unique. And this is why uh, I will not talk here. They are needed in general, according to the kind of surf uh, surface, some extra condition to reduce uh, the ambiguity about adding or not uh, an adding or not uh, an, uh, an harmonic uh, component. So, uh, 
once more, uh, the uh, for incompressible fluid, we were we were imposing, we were uh, putting ourselves in the second class, the version uh, equal to zero and and curl equal to omega, and we saw that we, we were free to introduce a psi, the stream function that allowed us to write this u in some Hamiltonian way, and this brought to this equation for psi there was a Poisson equation. Uh, and then again, for central forces, for example, for uh, attractive central forces, we are imposing that the curl of A is equal to zero, and this allowed us to introduce the C and rewrite A as the gradient of C. And now when we uh, substitute this into the second equation, the divergence of A, we obtain the, uh, the corresponding equation for uh, the potential of our test particle. So in both cases, we have a, a Poisson equation. Now, when, uh, when we want to generalize, I'm sorry, uh, when we want to generalize these two uh, uh, other kind of manifold, the suitable uh, formula is, is the one of differential geometry, because now we have everything free from coordinates. It's, it's necessary to introduce the operator that is much used into Arnold's book of uh, classical mechanics. We introduce this other uh, uh, differential operator, the minus Hodge D Hodge. And with these two, in general, we have the, uh, the our Laplace Beltrami uh, operator is written in this coordinate tree, uh, delta D plus D delta ways. And now we can translate all the familiar uh, um, physics formula into differential geometry once. So we have the, the curl of U now becomes the Hodge, the D omega U, and the where this omega U is just the corresponding uh, uh, one form when we use through the matrix. So we, we have our matrix that is, is the bilinear uh, uh, symmetric uh, tensor and we fit in our our uh, velocity field. So we are left with the one form. Uh, and also the divergence take this other uh, expression star uh, odge d odge omega u. And now, so now we are working with this omega u and now we have the corresponding hodge decomposition that has the one for vector field that can decompose our, uh, our, in this case, one form, the one we are considering, in three components. One that can be viewed as associated to uh, uh, the gradient, the, the alpha. The other that has a Newtonian can, a character, that, that this delta beta, where beta now is the two form, and the other that is uh, harmonic. And so all this can, can be viewed into a diagram. So we have U, we bridge to the one form, and then we, we use this operator to pull from the one form to another word form, to two form, and to function. So this is how this, uh, uh, I don't have too much time to go into it, but we can do this for the, also for the curl again. So we have something that we can do this in whatever surface. So once more, we have that both for vortices and for uh, uh, the gravitational problem, we have to solve Poisson equation in this static geometry. So here we are considering our metric is very much uh, uh, a static metric. It, it's still not into GR uh, uh, kingdom, but it could be very. So here it's static. So we have this common problem for the test particle. And there is a very nice article uh, about the Laplace Beltrame operator by Kimura that I strongly recommend to everyone. And so to give an example, for example, if uh, about the here, what is the S for the, uh, for the uh, mass problem? What is the S? The S is the distribution of mass that are inducing your gravitational field, okay? So, here an example, if we put a point mass uh, test particle and planet, so now we have n um, planet, so our right hand side will become the sum of delta function, each weighted for the mass of the corresponding planet, okay? 
And in general, for uh, more complicated geometry, we have to consider compensation field, but I'm not going to it now. So just a quick remark. What we, are, uh, we have seen is nothing original because actually Maxwell already done it, as many things Maxwell did before, <laughs> because this is what we are familiar with electrostatic. So electrostatic, the only difference is the divergence is positive because you are repulsing. So this is, has to do with the volume expanding instead of contracting in the gravitational field. But this is very similar to electrostatic. So uh, uh, gravity and electrostatic are just can be mapped one to the other, just uh, with a diff uh, difference of a sign. And now, okay, so, but we have a mechanical system, so we are happy about how to find our potential energy, but now we need a kinetic energy. And if you need a kinetic energy, this is very easy because if we have a, a metric that defines an inner product of uh, tangent vectors in, in, uh, 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 on the tangent space at the point P, we, we also have uh, that the inverse of the metric define the uh, inner product between momenta in the cotangent space. So this, the, the kinetic part is easy okay, in this problem. Once we have the metric, you have the kinetic part. Uh, and this is an example. We can see like the kinetic uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, spherical coordinate. We have the inverse. We can immediately write the, uh, the kinetic uh, part. Uh, so just a quick remark. So uh, this Poisson equation that is the central piece to be solved uh, is a linear equation. And so if we know S, we is need to find to, to get to find C is, is needed to find what is called the green function. There is the fundamental solution of this equation. And if we are in space that are not compact, so, uh, so for example, R2, R3, the puncture sphere, the hyperbolic plane, uh, and so on, the fundamental solution uh, is given by replacing the right hand side the delta. And so now we can find, solving this equation, we can find all the familiar potential. So now the familiar potential in R3, its solution of this equation is one over R, uh, minus one over R, and we can find the famous force one over two. Then we can solve in all sorts of other geometry, like the puncture sphere, the plane that will give the log R, and the hyperbolic plane. Okay, where in this context, the little r is the geodesic distance and k is the Gaussian curvature. Um, I have a paper on this, but once more, a very nice paper of Kimura that where I learned a lot of this. Uh, so, and now we got to the last part. So now some results. So Rodrigo in his master thesis uh, was considered the uh, the dynamics of two bodies in the intrinsic geometry of the plane. So he's using the log potential uh, and he showed that uh, the problem uh, is integral, but all orbit are limited, but we don't have anymore the, uh, the Kepler law, okay? Then uh, Glaston in his thesis uh, uh, studied the, um, the dynamics on the uh, cylinder and uh, and how you do this uh, well we use some uh, previous results actually this is also a long story that start with maxwell then goes to lamb and uh, to montaldi sulier and tokeda uh, to the uh, dynamic of vortices on a cylinder but now that we know what is the string function of or vortices on the cylinder. Now we know that it's, exact, it's going to be exactly the same as the potential uh, of a test particle uh, under gravitational law. So uh, how they do this? They cut the cylinder and they use, it, they use their, its covering space because now they map the problem to the planar problem when they don't have any kind of a problem to, uh, to do this all the necessary math and they move it back to the cylinder. So uh, this was the trick. And uh, 
so now on the cylinder you use a uh, cylindrical coordinate and so the metric uh, is very takes a very easy form and now here are the beautiful Poincare section uh, uh, that Glaston did. So we study uh, the Poincare, actually Glaston and Teresa did. <laughs> this is, is, their, is, their, is their subject actually. So uh, Poincare section, uh, we did two kind of Poincare section. When two uh, body were opposite, uh, so the phi is the, uh, is the angular distance between the two and when they were close. So uh, this is, this we observe that uh, H here is the energy. So you see that as you increase the energy, you see something uh, uh, interesting because you go from chaos to order and uh, the order increase, increase, and this is how the, the, the little island, the proliferation of little island, and eventually with a relatively energy of uh, 30, okay? So we, we, we were intrigued by uh, this uh, uh, going towards integrability as the energy was increased. And uh, uh, so we asked for help. <laughs> And Kiri Kumbo gave us, uh, actually, it was, was oh, intuitively is a nice problem, but then to prove it is through Galois theory. So actually, if you see the, uh, the potential of the, uh, of the two body in the, when you do reduction, you see that it's just the log of a sinus, uh, square sinus of phi and the hyperbolic sinus of z. So what happened when uh, uh, Z increase? Uh, when Z increase, so when the two body, for example, are very far apart along the, along the uh, uh, axis of the uh, cylinder, you have that this hyperbolic sign takes over the oscillatory part. And so basically this is how you go towards integrability because now your potential is basically just depending on the z variable and not on phi. So this is how the two body, when they're far apart, uh, they go towards integral motion. And um, then also we were interested to see how the uh, the uh, the nature, the fact that there is a hole in the cylinder, uh, uh, the topology of the cylinder has an impact. And so uh, Glasson also did this. Uh, this planar limit um, comparing two very close, uh, so this is why the Poincare section of phi equals to zero because they're very close to each other, these two body, uh, comparing the, the cylinder planar section with the uh, pla planar uh, section. And we see that the central region is a it, it brings the signature of the topology of the cylinder. And this, again, we see that when we lower the energy now, you see proliferation, proliferation of, uh, of island. And, uh, and again, it, it becomes a lot of island. Understandable, given the uh, form uh, of the Hamiltonian, because now, you, you got a logarithmic that actually the, the potential part is becoming more and more negative, uh, while instead the, uh, of course, the kinetic part is positive. So more you go negative, more you have space for um, having this kind of rich dynamics. Okay, so just to conclude, to have two minutes to conclude, three minutes, do I? Yes, do I have three minutes? Hello? Yes, yes, we have. <laughs> okay. Just to conclude, well, we cannot say since we are here, what is the shape of our planet? Uh, before special mission and airplane, uh, this has drawing, beautiful drawing about the shape of the space. We can conjecture whatever shape of our planet and some still conjecture, some still conjecture they might be flat. 
but now uh, we have this important uh, things about if it's uh, is this important question, what is the shape of an universe? If it's an open or closed? And it, this goes back to solving that particularly Poisson equation, because now if the uh, if we are solving that equation on a compact manifold, we cannot just have one mass uh, or one vortex. Uh, this has to compensate with something negative. Uh, and so either we have different equations or we have to think about uh, what kind of mass is out there. And in, in particle physics, actually, people are quite familiar with that because when you produce particle, you produce pair of particle. If you produce a particle and antiparticle, you never produce one particle out of energy. So um, this is something that is not a strain. And this is an article in the Quantum Magazine that I suggest uh, to think about, and it, it's very inspiring. And um, this also is the article uh, that talks about the cosmic nickel uh, uh, ray background that uh, kind of implies the possibility of this closed universe. And, um, and this is some outline about uh, 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 the curvature uh, even uh, of this our universe. So, uh, Going back to uh, uh, South America, we have now, uh, it's, it's expected to open in 2025. I don't know whether the pandemic is still true. Uh, this uh, European Extreme Large Telescope, uh, ALT, and uh, that is, uh, uh, is uh, we have this uh, Atacama in the Atacama Desert. So I, I don't know, we, in case we will have to a lot of uh, new uh, measure and new answer maybe, but there is a lot of math to do. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Stefanella. No. Uh, yeah. Questions? Any questions? I can send you the paper if you want, if someone is interested. Oh. Well, uh, Stefanella, maybe I would begin by asking a very pretty, uh, probably very silly question. No, they are not silly uh, questions. <laughs> is our universe compact or not? Huh? Is our universe compact or not? Well, this is what uh, this new measure, you know, this thing about the cosmic background is going back since I was an undergraduate student. <laughs> so it, it's not homogeneous, it's not isotropic, it's a, 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 a tropic. So uh, the latest view is that it might be compact. So this might bring a light that uh, there is this kind of antimatter that we are not taking account in the correct way. That maybe so far people have called dark energy, but maybe something else. And in, in this kind of formulation, this is close, is far from uh, from the, our matter because it's repelling. So, so this may be why we are not seeing it. I don't know, but this is a, a very interesting problem, an alternative problem, you know. I, I'm not a big fan of dark matter and dark energy, so I'm always uh, looking. I was happy about this option. So I, I'm not an observationist, so I think that we'll know more in 2025 when maybe we have this large telescope that might give us some insight. You know, we, we depend on observation, of course.
Yeah, Thank I, you. I, <laughs> I, I'm sorry about the modality. I have more, but in this modality, I can bring more, much more. <laughs> it's it's a modality that. <laughs> But actually, I want to say that here in Rio, we uh, we we have uh, we started a group about this, and he, some of the students are here, undergraduate, very eager undergraduate, and there is also a professor from General Relativity, Carlos Zaro. So we we are we are, we are starting a discussion among ourselves. So if someone wants to join, and even Rodrigo actually join us from Sweden. So. You're welcome to think with us about possible solutions. This this word we're trying to. Yeah. Ah, yes. One second. I Thank want you. to show you only one thing more. If uh, can I show you some simulation? I forgot the simulation. So I have to. Sure. I have to. Uh, Okay, you show me. I have to go. So I hope I see. I open. Uh, so, for example, let's see. Okay, so for example, these are two body on a sphere. And uh, and I have to, I have to restart. If I show another one, you will not see. If I show this, you you will see a different one. No, probably not. No, no, we see the same two bodies at this. Oh, okay, one second. Where if you want to share full screen, if you change uh, the window, you can. We can. Ah, see yeah. You. Okay. So one second. So I have to. And um, and again, you uh, you might have I I, I don't know this. So, and then you might have, for example, these are four vortices on the famous beam surfaces. You see, and now, for example, this configuration is just on the hedge between negative and positive uh, curvature. So, uh, of course, what would you expect if I perturb it? You would you expect it is stable or is unstable? Unstable. We can see. Unstable, excellent. You, you, can, you can see the uh, we simulation? Cannot. Ah, we cannot. Why you cannot see it? One second. Why you cannot see it? One second, I'll try to do it again. Uh, you can. I think it, wait, it is wait loading. It's loading. Wait we we just wait. Yeah, we just wait maybe one minute. Ah, yes. Wait a little bit. Yeah. You see? No, not yet. Not, not yet. I, I see here. Yes, I see. But it's coming. You see? Okay. So this is exactly on the edge between negative and positive curvature. We don't see it. Uh, not yet, not yet. Uh, so it's still loading. Oh my god, because I see it, it's so funny. Yes. So we don't see all the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You see this uh, RMP? Uh, you see wait. this RMP? <laughs> just wait, it takes a minute. In Minas Gerais, we see it. Ah, you see? <laughs> we see it now, though. We don't. Paulo também. In Paris, see? also, it's very clear. Yeah, but it's not totally global. <laughs> <laughs> so can can I show the the perturbed version? Not, not yet. You have to wait. Okay. 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 okay now we see it. Oh, I see it now. Okay. So this is unperturbed. Unperturbed. So can I perturb it? Yes. Perturb yeah. it. Okay. So I am. I perturb it. So let's perturb. So now I have to remember where this perturbation is here. So can you see it, the perturbation? Oh. It takes at least one minute for no, us to see uh, it. Uh, uh, wait, wait. It's still loading from my side. Minas is perturbed. 
Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I will not show other simulation, but at least I thought this is interesting because if people can see some of the vortices fall into the negative stuff that is more stabilizing and one fall into the positive, so it's, it got separated. Can you see it? It's, a, it's expected to be unstable, but this is kind of a nice problem. And one, as a, we can study all circuits of, of revolution. So it's a rich, uh, rich variety of vortex and uh, mass dynamics that. Per finally, it's out. Yeah, that one can study a lot of interesting problems. And you see here, here the, the nice thing is that this is a conformal deformation of the sphere. So it's, it doesn't have holes, so mathematically it's tractable, you know, uh, and so on. Okay, so I hope, I hope that you, you could hear something. <laughs> so, happy birthday, Deberto. Another time I will talk about our results, more technical, but this, I will just want to stress the, the, uh, the the importance of what are the hypotheses of the modeling part. This was my goal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Stefanella. And uh, any thank you. For the, uh, so, any further question, or uh, or uh, or that's it for? Uh, is there any uh, can be any any presentation afterward? No. We we have the video. Okay. Uh, so, can it? Uh, uh, do you have any arrangement after the talk? Maybe? I sorry, I didn't listen for change. Ah, I I mean, so, uh, do you have any arrangement after the talk, or maybe not? Yeah, we have a small video. I'm waiting. Marcelo authorizes me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I that's what I'm asking. Uh, let me see. Okay. So I will wait to come into everybody so everybody can see. Yeah, I see here. So, uh, you can see I can see yeah. from China, yeah. from uh, US. Okay, okay. So I'm going to to start.
All right, then, uh, uh, thanks, Annet, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending the talk. So, uh, that, that's it for today. All right. Then I'll uh, see you next time. Then. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.